container, in which that uh, document properties can be effectively used as a sort of uh, unifying bridges across different platforms of tools. In the sense of uh, objects, they can be profitably used uh, for uh, transferring uh, concepts, ideas, and uh, the data across uh, uh, theories belonging to the possibility that uh, they are um, So I would like uh, to start with the uh, Slightly presentation of uh, what we did about the unifying nature of uh, topics. This is the, uh, my own uh, translation uh, from French. Uh, this uh, citation is taken from the Cortes Maya, and it's also very well done. So, uh, what uh, Rodemix says about the topic is uh, quite uh, striking. Yeah, in fact, uh, he insists uh, on uh, the unifying nature of properties in many forms of this text, but uh, this is uh, one place where it is uh, especially uh, striking. So, what he says is uh, it is the topospheme, uh, which is the bed of the grid, uh, where some numeric, geometry and algebra, the world of arithmetic, mathematical logic, and engineering, the world of the continuum, the bed of the two groups, and the two what I have considered most broad to perceive the finance and by the same language the rules of geometric reference and dimensions, which is common to its equations, most distant from one of each other, coming from one region or another of the planet. So you see, um, he was uh, fully convinced uh, of uh, the unifying uh, potential of the natural process. And still, uh, in fact, uh, he also complains uh, of the fact that um, some sense of this potential has remained uh, quite neglected in, uh, in the future years in the sense that the uh, properties of cost have been applied in many contexts in many successful ways. Uh, but uh, this uh, role of uh, properties as uh, unifying spaces in mathematics uh, still uh, has to be. Uh, to be uh, more widely explored. And for this reason, uh, when I started uh, my PhD studies, I was uh, interested in trying uh, to build uh, some uh, general methodologies which uh, can uh, really make the unification uh, concrete uh, as much as possible, um, in the sense of uh, really uh, starting to use uh, properties very effectively as means for transferring the knowledge across uh, different theories. And uh, in fact, one uh, uh, key ingredient that uh, I have been uh, building on uh, is the notion of uh, classifying topos from uh, topological methods. And I'm going to uh, uh, recall that the necessary preliminary for uh, understanding the Okay, so I will uh, uh, just start with some uh, uh, general background on top of this, what the main things that we do uh, on here uh, already with uh, the toposphere. Um, and then I will uh, uh, talk to more precisely about the perspective of topism in the physics, and uh, then I will uh, present some uh, examples and uh, applications. So both today uh, and uh, especially tomorrow, where I will be concerned with more advanced. Okay, so um, first of all, it is important uh, to remark uh, the multifaceted nature of topologies. Uh, this is uh, really pretty striking uh, that uh, we have a notion in mathematics that can be really approached uh, in uh, completely different ways. Uh, so, a lot of these topos can be seen uh, on the one hand as a generalized space. Uh, this was uh, the original Rothenbusian uh, 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 conception. But it can also be seen as a mathematical universe in which one can do mathematics in a uh, quite a similar way as one normally does it uh, with respect to the classical secular implementation. So this is a second uh, key point which was introduced uh, later by the tradition. And then there is a third point of view, um, which is uh, quite related to the so, a grotendic topos can also be seen as a suitable kind of first order theory, modulo an equivalence relation of theories which identifies the two theories when they have the same classified topos and makes a prevalence relation as well as an equivalence because it generalizes the classical notion of the 
So now I'm going to to say just a few words about what you can do say continue and then show that talk about the more knowledge of safety for the So how were our purposes uh, introduced? Well uh, we were introduced uh, in the other sixty five what we did with uh, uh, the aim of uh, some sense uh, enlarging the uh, the the context in which uh, uh, a geometric or topological base would need to be applied. So, in particular, the need for toposes uh, was determined by uh, uh, the notion of solving the structure. So, there was a need of a uh, more general topology theory, which uh, would not be a topology theory of uh, topological spaces. And so, Joseph uh, Dick uh, introduced uh, the notion of topos as uh, a category of sheets on. Uh, not on uh, just on topological spaces, or rather on something more general than uh, the classical notion of the covering of an open set by a collection of open sets as the theory of the So, what we did was, uh, uh, well, basically, the, the first uh, remark uh, that we made was that, uh, uh, in fact, the main important properties of topological spaces can uh, actually be naturally reformulated as. Uh, Categorical properties of the associated categories of sheets and sets and whatever. So, for instance, you can imagine that an empty space or a compact space uh, and so on. So, all these uh, classical topological uh, uh, properties can actually be expressed in a purely variant way by working at the level of the transformed sheet. And so, in some sense, uh, this uh, makes you understand that uh, you can. Uh, Want to do topology, you can uh, to prepare a work with the corresponding category which is rather than the topological spaces themselves. And this, of course, has uh, many uh, advantages. For instance, uh, I mean, uh, while a topological space is a uh, small object uh, which uh, doesn't have any kind of structure itself, uh, a topos, uh, I mean, a category of uh, sheets uh, on uh, the corresponding category of sheets itself. Has instead a very, very rich categorical structure, so you can really compute inside uh, such an object to be considered in having uh, smaller limits, uh, smaller limits, you even have exponentials which are analogs of functional spaces, etc. So you see, um, by uh, and, uh, in particular, you can define topological invariants uh, right at the top level. So it really makes sense to, uh, uh, to replace the topological spaces. Uh, uh, at least uh, those spaces which are sufficiently well behaved, even if you can say solar spaces. So in particular, you can do this for all the separated spaces because you can recover them up to only your feet and from the corresponding uh, properties. So it really makes sense to replace them with the, the corresponding the category of sheets. And one advantage of doing this is that you can define the sheets not just for topological spaces, but you can define them on uh, anything which is called the site. So the idea is that uh, when you define a sheet of topological space, uh, there is just the two things that you use. You use the category of uh, open sets of the space uh, with uh, uh, the arrows which are just the inclusion. So uh, then you define a three sheets, uh, which will be just uh, factors from uh, these uh, sets. And the sheet condition can be uh, entirely formulated just in terms of uh, the categorical structure uh, present uh, here. Um, so here I'm really considering the category. And then, of course, I need an additional ingredient to define sheets, which is the notion of uh, covering of uh, an open set by a family open subsets. And notice that this I can uh, categorically regard this just as a collection of arrows going to the same uh, codomain. And so uh, Broken Dick said, okay, so since we only need uh, these uh, two basic ingredients, the category of open set and uh, this uh, notion of uh, covering, which uh, is just, uh, it consists in giving uh, to each uh, uh, Open set a family of uh, uh, a family of uh, open subsets which uh, which cover it. So 
So the idea is uh, let's replace this by an arbitrary multi that you will see with what he called the uh, topology, and now we call it the blocking topology, which is going uh, just to generalize this. So it's going to be um, just, uh, I mean, a way of assigning each object C and the C a collection of hovering C's of C. So this is usually like that. So what is a covering C on C? Well, uh, uh, well, a sieve is just a collection of uh, arrows with uh, for the main C, which is closed under the position of the and, uh, and basically, Grotendieck requires some uh, natural conditions uh, for this to be technically well behaved. So, in particular, for instance, you want to, uh, I mean, the maximal sieve is always covering, and you also want to take. Uh, That, and if you take uh, a covering seed here, then uh, the full vector seed is also covering. And so on. You have the transitive interaction which goes uh, in the other direction. And basically, it turns out that by defining uh, uh, the topology in this way, it is possible to define sheets on such a pair. Such a pair is called the site. So, the site is simply a a pair consisting of four categories of the topology, and you can define sheets on, um, on such a pair in a completely analogous way as you do the topology aspects, and this is what we are going to do. Okay, so uh, now, second point of view, uh, actually, uh, uh, this is a more logical point of view, focusing on mathematical universe. Um, in fact, uh, the coefficient uh, of the field uh, would be like that. It is covered by that. Uh, actually, you can, uh, if you just uh, focus on the categorical structure of uh, such an object, you can uh, consider models of uh, essentially any kind of first order theory in them. So, um, this uh, uh, works uh, in a completely analogous way as you. Set theory. So basically, a model of a certain structure of theory uh, is just a way of interpreting an sort by a set and then a function symbol by a function, then a relation symbol by a subset. And so, in a topos, you, you interpret a sort by an object, in a topos, in every function symbol by an arrow, in a topos, in every symbol by a subset, and everything works. Uh, in the same way, and it is possible to do that uh, because uh, you see, when uh, you have um, in the first order law these very complicated formulas involving the projectives and quantifiers, of course, uh, when you interpret this in uh, the classical set theoretic framework, uh, you can do this because the set theory, in set theory, you can perform all these operations, you can take unions, intersections, and so on. And in fact, it turns out that uh, because the uh, global topos is very rich in terms of categorical structure, you can do exactly the same thing uh, in an arbitrary topos. So it makes sense to speak of uh, models of the first of the topos. And this is um, quite interesting because we no longer have just one fixed universe in which we can uh, study our theory, but we have infinitely many universes in which we can consider models of our we can change them. And in particular, it, it turns out that for any first order theory of a general, of a, of a very general kind, technically speaking, a geometric theory, there will be one privileged topos, the classified topos of the theory, which will uh, provide, in some sense, the ideal point of view for studying the theory. It will be the place where the symmetries of the theory reveal themselves in uh, the most natural way. And so you see, it is very important to be able to consider models of theories in, uh, in arbitrary topos. So now we come to the third point of view, uh, which is exactly this, the point of view of toposes as the classifying the toposes of certain theories. Well, as I have said, um, many uh, first order mathematical theory whose axioms can be presented in a particular form, this is uh, what we require. You, can, you require the actions of the theory to be written in this form, so, uh, uh, x is equal to 
organization, a file that is I, where these are uh, geometric formulas. So, geometric formulas means built out of atomic formulas uh, by only using the finitary conjunctions, possibly infinite constructions, and the basis. This is uh, the notion of the geometric theory. So it, it appears at first sight quite restricted, but that in fact it is not because you can always geometrize a given finite additional <coughs> theory uh, so that uh, it appears classically uh, I cannot give an example of this, but it's something very well So if a theory has this form that all the axioms can be presented in a immediate way, then one can canonically associate to it a topos called uh, its classified topos, uh, which uh, actually represents its models in arbitrary topos. So, what does it mean? It means that we have a categorical equivalence between, uh, on the one hand, the category of uh, models of the theory inside the topos P, and the category of uh, uh, geometric morphisms, which are the, the natural models of the topos P. From E to the classified topos, naturally in uh, E. So, uh, this means in particular that there is one particular model of the theory inside the classified topos, which is the image of the identity geometric topos, which generates all the other models of the theory as in this picture. You see, here I have represented uh, topos by these colored figure uh, shapes. So, uh, the classified topos is the, is the yellow star there, and uh, the models of the theory inside them are these lighter shapes. So, as you can see, we have a universal model U, which generates all the other models just by applying the inverse image factors of uh, the geometric models. And so, these features uh, make you understand mm -hmm. actually that uh, you see the, the right, in some sense, point of view uh, for studying the certain theory is not provided by the classical set based models, which are just the points of the classified topos, but it is really provided by the universal model aligned in the classified topos. Because, of course, we can take, for instance, this topos to be the topos of sets, but it will be just one particular choice, and everything that happens in set is just the image of something which happens up there. So, it is important to be able to study what happens really at the level of the classifying topos for understanding the theory of course. Now, just a, a brief remark, we can always build the classifying topos of the theory uh, in a completely canonical way for any geometric theory by taking the category of sheets on its syntactic side. So, what is the syntactic side of the theory? Uh, well, it is the last They, they often uh, uh, they 
often happen to be uh, geometric, but if they are not, uh, it is always possible, possible by means of a canonical process, which is called the modernization, uh, to uh, construct uh, a geometric theory uh, with uh, uh, essentially the same set-based models, uh, but uh, whose syntax uh, uh, satisfies these requirements. So it is possible actually to study all the uh, the theories, the modern theories are introduced uh, by uh, using this method. And here there is also an additional advantage with respect to classical modern theory is the fact that uh, this logic is also infinitary. So in particular we can take uh, uh, infinitary distributions, not just uh, finitary ones. And this is useful for describing many notions, for instance, uh, the property of an element of the ring being impotent, or um, uh, the property of a Heat extension to the algebraic. You see, all these properties they require an infinitary extension, and so we can treat them by using geometry theory, why it would be uh, much more problematic to do it in the last one. Okay, so I was uh, uh, saying that uh, we can always build the classified the theory in a purely syntactic and canonical way. So, what we have to do is uh, to um, construct the so called syntactic side. Of, uh, of a theory. So basically, this is just a sign which is made up of the formulas, uh, of the geometric formulas related to the real language of the theory, uh, considered in a given context. So this means that I am considering a, a finite list of variables uh, indicated by x, uh, which contains all the free variables of the formula. The free variable for those uh, of you who do not know uh, no logic means uh, that they do not appear quantified in the formula. Okay? So the, the objects, these are going, uh, these are the objects of uh, uh, our syntactic category. These are considered, of course, up to renaming equivalents. So that could, uh, instead of choosing X, I could choose Y and uh, rewrite accordingly, but this is only a list means uh, condition. Uh, so these are the objects and the, the arrows are the um, formulas in uh, the two set of variables which are uh, probably uh, functional from <coughs> the domain, physical domain. And uh, so uh, consider them up to um, provable equivalence. So the, the arrows are uh, equivalence, uh, provable equivalence classes of formulas which are probably functional from the domain to the domain. Probably functional in the theory. So it means that uh, the, the free sequence which uh, express uh, the functionality properties, they are provable in the theory. So you see, this is completely inside. Um, and uh, what uh, you can uh, do, uh, so uh, of course you take it classical in this way, and uh, you can uh, put a Grothendieck topology on it, uh, which is defined in a uh, uh, very natural way. So suppose that you have a So you will uh, say that uh, such a sieve is covering uh, if and only if a certain sequence which uh, essentially says in logical terms that uh, this is uh, a jointly subjective theory is a probable okay, so now if and only if And, uh, and so the result is that uh, the classifying topos uh, actually is the topos of chips. And this uh, actually is not hard to prove, uh, but uh, this construction is really marvelous because it is completely canonical, very general, you can apply it uh, always. In fact, it is a generalization of the Lindemann-Karski algebra of the proposition theory. 
but it is, uh, you see, it's really a first order, uh, very natural general executive term, um, and it gives uh, this uh, wonderful uh, representability result, uh, which of course opens uh, a lot of uh, new uh, possibilities for uh, the model theory of the first order. Okay, so now that we have defined the classifying hypothesis, uh, it is uh, natural to uh, wonder if, uh, first of all, uh, different theories can have the same classifying topos, and also uh, if every grotendic topos can be seen as the classifying topos of some theory. So, first uh, question, uh, of course, it might happen, and in fact, uh, this is an extremely deep and interesting phenomenon, which uh, actually is at the, at the core of the great thing. Might happen that the two completely different theories might have the same classical purpose. In this case, we talk of uh, Morita and Dickens. Uh, it is also true that every grotendic topos actually can be seen as the classifying topos of some theory. Uh, this is why, uh, this is because uh, actually the grotendic topos uh, can always be presented. Uh, as the category of sheets on, uh, on the side, and, uh, and for any non side uh, like this, we can write down a geometric theory. Formally, this is called the theory of uh, uh, J continuous uh, class factor of C, which is a class factor by. Uh, So, actually, this uh, allows one to really regard the grotendic topos as a canonical representative of uh, equivalence classes of theory in the of topos. So, this completes uh, the term uh, of the classical forms of view on the topos which I mentioned at the beginning of the video. So, now we can uh, uh, start uh, introducing uh, this uh, perspective of topos integrated, which is actually founded on the fact that precisely that there is uh, this ambiguity, which is inherent to the definition of topos, uh, which is the fact that different, completely different mathematical theories can uh, be classified by the same topos. So it is natural to wonder what does this mean. I mean, geometrically, it means that uh, we have uh, different sides of definition or uh, different representations, more generally, of the same topos. Uh, this is something that, uh, of course, uh, uh, was uh, already known uh, to Grotendieck. In fact, Grotendieck uh, made the following observations as, uh, as we have uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, representations for, uh, for a group, so in the same way we can have uh, infinity, uh, side, different sides of definition for the same topos. And in fact, uh, basically saying that we have uh, different theories classified by the same topos is uh, essentially the logical version of the statement that uh, there exists uh, infinitely many different representations in terms of size of the same thing. Now, uh, in such a situation, what is natural uh, to do is uh, to try to use uh, the, the classifying topos, the common classifying topos of the pair of uh, molecular equivalent theories as a sort of bridge for transferring results across the theories. Because if you think about what it means for two theories to have the same classifying purposes, basically it means that these two theories, uh, syntactically, they could be completely different. So the languages could be completely different. But it means that they share the same semantics. It means that the models of the two theories can be identified via a categorical equivalence in a natural way. So it really uh, expresses the feeling of looking at a certain thing in different ways or constructing the same object in different languages and so on. So uh, it is something which uh, actually is at the core of many uh, important uh, phenomena in mathematics. And so it makes sense to try to elaborate a circle of techniques which allow one to actually use uh, classifying purposes as, as we have to use. So what do we do? Actually, uh, we do the, the, the obvious thing. So we uh, consider uh, invariance uh, at the topos generative level. So by an invariant, I mean uh, either a property or a construction defined for topos, which uh, is invariant with respect to categorical equivalence. 
this is important because I want to be able to regard it both from the point of view of the first representation and from the point of view of the second representation. So, for any such invariant, we look at how this invariant expresses itself first in the context of the first theory and then in the context of the second theory. So, in more technical terms, what is going on here is that uh, we have uh, different sides on the same purpose. Then we consider invariance I defined here, and we try to understand how this invariant expresses themselves in uh, the context of the two different sides. I am uh, writing this diagram because actually in practice one works with sites, so theories are represented by sites, so actually this is what uh, uh, is technically going on. So actually one looks uh, for arches of uh, this bridging, so what are these uh, arches? Well, they, they are given by characterization of this kind, like on one end, uh, so we have two arches, so one kind. Uh, so on one end, we look for a characterization of I in terms of this side, so uh, we look for a characterization of this kind. This satisfies I, even only if the side satisfies a certain property, which of course should be genuinely written in the language of the side, without any reference to cheats or topos. Important because otherwise uh, it is useless. Uh, so um, we, we and then we on the other side we try to do something uh, completely analogous. So we look for uh, expressions of our invariants. And so what will be the result of doing uh, such a thing? Well, is that if we actually manage to find this equivalence, it will be able to conclude that these two properties which will be completely concrete, because one will be written in the language of the first side and the second will be written in the language of the second. So they, they could be concretely completely different, but they will uh, become equivalent just because they will be the manifestations of a unique invariant defined at the level of properties. And what is in interesting about this is the fact that even if we have just one invariant defined at this level, when we uh, study how this invariant manifests itself in the context of different sites, we might find properties which concretely are completely different. I just mentioned a couple of examples. If you take I to be the property of a topos to be Boolean, if you look at these invariants in terms of uh, orthoposis of shifts of topological space, what you get uh, is the property that uh, every uh, open set is good. And uh, But if you look at it uh, from the point of view of the topos of three shifts, uh, you get the property that the C is a group of it. So you see, these uh, are properties that uh, look completely different from each other. And this is very simple invariant. If I take a slightly more complicated one, like the Morgan, the Morgan law on the top of I don't need to, to, to say what it is. What is interesting is that the, the formulations are completely different. So in the case of, uh, of X, what you get is uh, X is extremely complicated. So what does it mean? Uh, uh, that the closure of any open set is open. And uh, in this setting, what you get is the amalgamation property on C, which means that any pair of arrows with the same domain can be completely continued on this one. So, I mean, this is just to uh, uh, give an illustration of the fact that a given invariant, even a very simple one, because I mean, these invariants are much simpler than the cohomological invariants, for instance, you see, so they are quite simple invariants, but even for these simple invariants, they express themselves in uh, completely unexpected ways in the context of different representations. So, you see, this technique can, uh, is, uh, can be interesting because it allows you to relate uh, things that uh, you would have uh, probably never suspected to be uh, related. Okay, so just uh, a few uh, more remarks about uh, what is equivalence. Actually, the, uh, 
the notion of Morita equivalence uh, in terms of classifying properties seems to something quite uh, uh, technically restricted because you see you require the equivalence of categories of models in every growth in the topos naturally in the topos. So this uh, looks like a very restrictive condition. But in fact, uh, what I would like to suggest is that uh, the, <laughs> the reality is, uh, is quite different in the sense that uh, Morita equivalences are everywhere, actually. And in fact, uh, in my work, I have uh, really tried to, um, to look for uh, where Morita equivalences might arise, and I have realized that uh, in many situations, when you find yourself in the, in the situation where you have different uh, languages for talking about the same structures, uh, uh, different intuitions about an object or different ways of thinking the same thing, uh, you can actually formalize uh, these situations uh, in, uh, in many cases and the Morita equivalence is between them. In fact, Scopus theory is actually pretty subtle for allowing you to uh, formalize in this way. In, in fact, uh, uh, many important dualities and equivalences in mathematics can actually be interpreted uh, either as Morita equivalences or as arising from Morita equivalences in research theories. So tomorrow uh, I'm going to talk about the prices theory, model theory, and model <coughs> theory. And we will see in fact that uh, not only the topos theoretic viewpoint will completely unify them, but it will also generalize them and allow one to build uh, Galois type theories <laughs> almost everywhere in, in mathematics. But uh, I mean, today I will give uh, more uh, uh, basic uh, examples uh, concerning the stone type dualities. And uh, we shall see that, in fact, uh, all the classical uh, stone type dualities uh, can be obtained out of uh, topos theoretic bridges, and that the topos theoretic viewpoint allows one to get more complicated dualities that uh, could be harder to establish without any, in some sense, machinery behind. Uh, uh, so, it is also important to remark that uh, topos theory itself is a primary source of Morita equivalences because, uh, as we have remarked, uh, having uh, different sites of definition for the same topos actually amounts to having uh, different uh, theories classified by the same topos since one can attach, as we have said, uh, to any site uh, a theory uh, which is classified by the corresponding uh, topos of Schiffsman. So actually, it turns out that the topos theory itself, as a subject, can allow you to discover new dualities. And in fact, uh, in my work, I have uh, generated many new dualities, just starting from uh, the, the internal techniques uh, in, in the topos theory, for, uh, so for starting from the representation theories, uh, theories for topos, uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, an important point that, uh, that I also would like to make is that uh, any dictionary between uh, two theories, by a dictionary, I mean technically speaking, for definitions, I mean by interpretation. So, what, what do I mean? I mean uh, any way that you have of uh, assigning to every formula in the language of the first theory, a formula in the language of the second theory, in such a way that you get a syntactic equivalence which induces an equivalent at the level of models. So, of course, when you have uh, such a situation, you always have a Morita equivalence. It's pretty clear. Uh, because actually, adding a by interpretation means that uh, the syntactic categories of the two theories are equivalent. And of course, if you have such an equivalence, then uh, uh, since uh, the syntactic topologies are defined intrinsically in terms of the categorical structures of the syntactic category, I will be able to conclude that uh, the classifier. But uh, what is uh, really interesting is that, uh, in fact, most uh, Morita equivalences are not at all in this form. And uh, this is interesting in relation to the translations that uh, the bridge technique allows one to realize because, uh, you see, when you translate things across uh, by interpretation, you will not really change the shape of the results in a significant way because, you see, if you have the three formulas on one hand, you will have the three formulas on the other. And, you are just going to rename things. While uh, when you do these topos theoretic translations, the properties uh, can uh, really, as uh, we have already remarked, change uh, significantly. Okay, so now um, I would like just to 
uh, go more uh, into the uh, into the technique um, by uh, focusing on two special uh, classes of theories that, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, come naturally to the attention when one takes the context of uh, the classical hypothesis. Because uh, since uh, I mean uh, every joint uh, theory has a classical hypothesis, it makes sense to, in some sense, organize the theories according to the type of topos they are. Uh, classified to. So there are two uh, particularly important classes of geometric theories that it is naturally to, uh, natural to investigate. On the one hand, we have the theories of Frisch's type, which means classified by a Frisch's purpose, and on the other hand, we have the theories of Galois type, which uh, are those classified by purposes of continuous actions of the theory. Why do I uh, single out this? Uh, uh, two, of course, uh, we have just the two notable classes, of course, there are two other important classes of theory. But um, in these uh, two lectures, I would like to focus uh, uh, mostly on uh, these two uh, types because they are quite uh, representatives of uh, um, the kind of uh, insights that uh, Topos theory can bring in the study of theory. Because, uh, in some sense, they are uh, extremal classes. <laughs> Uh, with respect to uh, a natural ordering of theories that you can have uh, uh, when you fix a certain signature. You see, suppose that you fix a language. You mean the language? Yes, it means a language, uh, so sorts, uh, function symbols, and relational symbols. Uh, so, of course, uh, when you fix uh, such a signature, uh, you have a natural ordering between uh, theories. If you say that one theory is uh, less than or equal to another, if every axiom uh, of the first theory is provable in the second theory. And uh, so you can uh, wonder what are the minimal elements, what are the maximal elements with respect to this order. Well, uh, for instance, the theories of Galois type, they are always maximal theories, in the sense that you cannot extend them anymore. So any extension will be fixed. Either uh, you, you go into the contradictory theory or you stay in the theory itself. So, and this is essentially. You cannot add axioms. Yes, you cannot add any axioms. Yeah. Uh, and this is connected to the logical uh, phenomenon of the completeness of the theories, but we shall talk about this uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, for the moment, I would like uh, to say a few words about the theories of Frisch type, which are very important because, in some sense, they stay at the other side of the spectrum. They are the simplest theories from which any other theory can be obtained. Uh, for instance, uh, you can <coughs> say the empty theory uh, over any, where you don't put any axiom, and this is a theory of Frisch's type. And uh, all the other theories, in some sense, will be below it, because they will be obtained just by adding axioms. Uh, and this, of course, reflects the fact that every, every broken topos is a subtopos of the Frisch's topos. So you see, it is a, when you want to study topos is, uh, as represented in terms of sites, uh, well, you know very well that, uh, in some sense, the fundamental uh, topos are uh, the Frisch's topos, and these are the topos of sheets uh, on, on the site. Uh, they can always be seen as uh, subtopos. So this means that we have a geometric morphism, uh, subtopos morphism, whose uh, direct image is the input, and whose index image is uh, the associated sheet map. And it is very important to consider this uh, morphism because it uh, uh, tells you, in particular, how uh, the category C is related to a corresponding topos of sheets because here you have the domain and and then uh, what you do, uh, if you want to go from C to the corresponding topos, is you compose with the associated sheet factor. So, of uh, course, this is very important. We have not to do it. Uh, remember? Uh, and so, you see, uh, uh, since uh, every block and deep topos is uh, a subtopos of a free sheet topos, it makes sense to uh, study the theories which are classified by this topos because any other theory actually we have. Uh, Classifying topos, which is a subtopos of this. And in fact, uh, as I have shown in my PhD thesis, uh, the subtopos of the classifying topos of the geometric theory are, in the nature of bijection, uh, the theory extensions of the theory remaining in the example. So actually, it is quite intuitive. So the more
more axioms uh, you put, uh, the finer the topology becomes. Because in fact, uh, uh, additional axioms correspond to additional topologies. And so on. Okay, so now let's uh, uh, say a few words about the theories of the issue type. A very important uh, thing that uh, is important, a uh, very important thing that uh, is interesting to remark is the fact that, in fact, uh, theories of Lichit type can really be seen as the logical counterpart of the small categories. I mean, um, I said that every topos can be seen as the classifying topos of some theory. So this means, in some sense, that uh, there is always a syntactic uh, representation of any topos available. Because uh, uh, we have seen that uh, any the classifying topos of any geometric theory can be represented in, in a completely scientific way. So this means that even if your topos comes from algebra or geometry or analysis, you can always study it by using logic, if you want. And this is a powerful statement, because sometimes it is easier to prove results using logical techniques and then translate them back into uh, the field of mathematics uh, in which uh, they were originally formulated. An example will be provided tomorrow with Galois theory. Because in fact, uh, I have a general categorical uh, theorem about uh, the generalizing the uh, grotting theory of Galois categories and the process construction. And actually, the way I proved this result is by using logical techniques. The proof was really very short, half a page, while proving it by using uh, categorical techniques, uh, in my opinion, would have been much, much harder. So, uh, looking at uh, this uh, topos from the point of view of uh, the structure we classify, if you look, for instance, at the points of a pre shift topos, well, uh, take uh, a topos like this. So, what are the points? These are the flat functors on CO. Uh, so, uh, the category of uh, the points is the in the completion of the category C. And, uh, in fact, uh, the logical perspective uh, is uh, quite, uh, quite natural because, you see, any theory of pre type, for any theory of pre type, its category of set base model is equivalent to the in the completion of the full subcategory of the finitely presentable model. Because, in fact, uh, here, of course, you have an embedding of C into the in the completion, and it's uh, important to realize that um, uh, this uh, category C up to Cauchy completion can be realized as the full subcategory of that on the finitely presentable model. So you see. Uh, what, does, what does mean uh, Cauchy completion? Uh, I don't want to split in the completion. So, so this is a Karubi? Or... Yes, it's Karubi and the local. Uh, so, uh, you see, uh, uh, in some sense, you understand already from this uh, simple example, you understand that uh, the logical language is quite pertinent, you see, because it makes you understand uh, really very well the relationship between C and the incompletion. The incompletion corresponds to all the set plate models of the theory. The category C, up to Cauchy completion, corresponds to taking just the finally, finally presented. And it's very important to remark this, that any small category C is, up to the important split completion, the category of finitely presentable models of the theory of which is not. And this category here has a completely syntactic description. Because, as in algebra, when you have a finitely, you see, you, take, you can take C, uh, any uh, algebraic theory, in fact, uh, any finite algebraic theory is of the type, and in that case, actually, this category there is the dual of uh, a completely syntactic uh, category because uh, you can identify the finitely presentable models with the formulas which present them. So you see, and this you also have uh, in the setting of the theory of the shift type, you have uh, that um, uh, the, the, the semantic and the syntactic notion of finite presentability uh, coincide. And, uh, and so this allows one actually to pass from logic to category theory in a very uh, useful uh, way. And another reason for which uh, uh, theories of pre-shift type are technically interesting 
is the fact that uh, you can always represent their classifying purpose in at least two significantly different ways because you always have the syntactic representation, always have trying to make it clear. But in the theories of the style, you have this quite different representation uh, obtained by taking the covariant uh, factors um, from uh, the category of frenetic representable models to uh, the category of And so it makes sense to apply the bridge technique to try to uh, establish links between the syntax and the semantics. The syntax is represented by the syntactic size, and the semantics is uh, here uh, the, the finite representable. Uh, just a correct clarification about the, the notion of finite presentability. Here, by finite representable in the semantic sense, I mean that uh, the home functor is uh, to preserve integrity. This is the thing. To be bit means inductive bit. Yes, inductive bit. Uh, so this is the definition, but uh, I have proved actually that for any theory of Rishi type, this notion, this semantic notion of finite representability, coincides with the syntactic notion of saying that there exists a formula which presents a model. So, which means, uh, say, to say that uh, a model uh, is uh, presented by a formula, and you write like that, if uh, the homomorphisms of models uh, to any set of eight models are in fact elements of the interpretation of the formula in F. Okay, uh, and so uh, here is uh, just one example of a, of a theory uh, which was obtained by using a bridge starting from this uh, double representation of the classifying purpose. So it is a definability theory, which is by no means trivial, even in the particular case of one theory. Uh, take, uh, you, take, you can take, uh, for instance, P to be the theory of groups. Uh, and uh, here, you take, um, um, you suppose that you have, for every finitely presentable group, uh, a property of a collection of elements of it, uh, which is factorial, in the sense that every group homomorphism preserves then the theory tells you that there exists a geometric formula which defines this property. Of course, you see, in one direction, this theory is trivial because, uh, I mean, if it is definable by a geometric formula, then uh, automatically it is factorial. But uh, think about it uh, in the other uh, direction. I am not aware of any <laughs> way of uh, proving this uh, without uh, uh, using uh, toposis. Uh, while uh, the topos theoretic proof uh, is a uh, one-line <laughs> proof, because uh, it suffices to uh, regard a certain invariant. Here you take uh, uh, the universal model of the theory, which of course admits uh, two different uh, descriptions in terms of the syntactic side and uh, in terms of uh, the standard representation. And if you look uh, um, of, um, at it, uh, its uh, subobjects, here you take precisely the factorial assignment. I mean, you take the properties which are preserved by uh, T model homomorphisms. But on the other hand, you find the formulas. And so you can conclude by the fact that they are just uh, instantiations of a unique property to find at the topos theoretic level, you can, uh, you can conclude that uh, you have this uh, Okay, so now uh, I think I still have five minutes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now I would like just to conclude uh, with um, uh, another illustration of the of bridge in a completely different context, in the context of the stone type duality. Um, so, of course, the most famous uh, duality, uh, which uh, gives the name to the whole class, is uh, stone duality for Boolean algebra, uh, which uh, actually gives a duality between the category of uh, Boolean algebra and the category of uh, compact. Uh, Ausdorf and uh, totally disconnected topological spaces. Uh, actually, this, uh, this duality, as well as all the other uh, classical dualities uh, belonging to the same class, can be obtained uh, just by factorializing bridges between uh, uh, different uh, representations of the same topos. So, in the case of Stone, uh, we have 
Julian algebra B and uh, the corresponding stone space, and they are related by an equivalence of toposes of this kind. You take sheets on the Boolean algebra considered as a pre order category with respect to the Boolean topology, and this is equivalent to sheets on the stone space. And uh, the way you get the, the duality uh, is uh, just by contrarializing this, because of course you want to make the, the algebra vary, so you consider. And uh, so uh, you use the theory of morphisms of sites to get uh, morphisms at the level of toposes. So here, uh, of course, a Boolean algebra of a morphism is a morphism between the sites, so it gives uh, a morphism between that. And this, of course, transfers to a morphism here, and then you actually exit the bridge. Uh, because uh, since uh, these spaces are sober, uh, Every geometric morphism we are cut as a side form and continue to cut the previous system. And so, this is how you get it. And more generally, what's going on here is that you start from equivalences uh, between um, uh, uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, toposes, which are induced by uh, growth and this comparison lemma. So, you start with a uh, uh, big site, uh, big, I mean, uh, big site uh, um, uh, B of uh, uh, KB, and uh, you take uh, a sub a full subcategory C of B, which is uh, dense with respect to the topology of K. Uh, dense means that every object of B can be covered by objects coming from the subcategory. And then uh, this, uh, uh, this theory tells you that the two toposes are always. Uh, and so uh, this is the setting, actually, and uh, what uh, you, uh, you do uh, to get uh, dualities is, first of all, you define uh, appropriate growth and deep topologies on uh, your sets which uh, capture the interesting lattice theoretic features of the, of the, of the, of the set. You see here, one wanted to capture the existence of finite joints in this category, and so this is why you uh, put the Boolean topology. But suppose that you have just a, I don't know, a discrete set. In a discrete set, you take the trivial topology. If you take a free frame, for instance, in which you have only directed joints, then you take the directed topology. If you take a frame, then you take the canonical topology, and so on. So you uh, attach natural growth and topologies to your structure. And then you use uh, the theory of uh, morphism subside either in the covariant or non-covariant version to uh, get uh, uh, geometric uh, uh, morphisms between the corresponding toposes. And then uh, the crucial point is uh, to be able to recover uh, um, your structures uh, from the corresponding toposes by using uh, suitable topos theoretic invariants. Because, of course, uh, you see, if you want to uh, build these bridges and not just enter a bridge but exit it, you need to be able to uh, recover the structure from the corresponding topos. Of course, uh, so this means in particular that all your topologies will need to be subcanonical, but of course, this will not suffice. But I have proved that if the topologies can be uniformly described by using a certain invariant C of the families of the subcardinal of this. Topos, then one can actually recover uh, the, the elements of the structure uh, from the topos as the subterminal objects which satisfy a compactness condition relative to this invariant C. So if C is to be finite, it will be the usual compactness. If C is uh, to be arbitrary, it will be uh, just uh, uh, backwards. Uh, if C is, uh, I don't know, to be a singleton, it will be super compact. If C is to be directed, it will be directed to compactness. So here is uh, an example. So Boolean algebra, as we have already talked about, but uh, here is uh, another uh, uh, example of a duality which uh, I have obtained. For, um, so it is a duality which extends uh, known as dualities for algebraic lattices and super semi uh, So if we take, for instance, a free frame, which is generated by a directedly which is generated by the 
is uh, directed to compact element, uh, then the comparison lemma gives us an equivalence of this kind. And uh, by factorializing, actually, so we can factorialize, factorialize in different ways. We can factorialize, uh, for instance, uh, contravariantly at the level of uh, uh, the free frame and covariantly at the level of uh, uh, this uh, set. Or we can also uh, try to, um, so in this way we get uh, a, a duality between the larger categories, which include on one hand uh, algebraic lattices and on the other hand uh, sub lattices. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you want to get uh, the, the classical duality, then you have to, to, to factorialize uh, contravariantly on both sides. But in any case, I mean, this is just meant to be an illustration of uh, the flexibility of this technique. As you can see, you have uh, various degrees of freedom in choosing the topologies, in choosing the, um, the, the way you can um, uh, factorialize uh, and so on. Um, so, um, so I will uh, now uh, stop here. Of course, I would like to mention that this paper uh, here, of course, contains uh, dozens of uh, examples of dualities, both old and new, uh, which uh, can be obtained through this uh, framework. And I mean, if you are interested uh, about the general perspective of proposals and bridges, the most recent text that I have written is uh, my application uh, thesis, uh, which I recently had in France. And also, there is a forthcoming book uh, about the which uh, will uh, appear in the uh, uh, But uh, tomorrow I'm going uh, to, um, uh, to present more uh, significant uh, examples. Uh, so this thing of stone type dualities was just meant to be a toy model to get you used uh, with this uh, methodology, but uh, tomorrow there will be deeper results, but still obtained in the same sense. Okay, so I'll stop uh, here. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any comments or questions? Can you repeat your second question? Ah, not a question, just a comment. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know that again. Yes. So, the first country that you refer to the same topics. Equivalent. I don't really mean isolated. No, equivalent to topics. Well, this is the, the, the criterion of, yes, it is a categorical equivalent. In fact, you can build bridges even if you don't have categorical equivalences, but uh, this is the criterion of identity for purposes, and it is quite uh, good because the advantage is that uh, whatever uh, property you formulate in categorical language will be automatically invariant. So you see, you have uh, a great number of invariants at your disposal, you can invent uh, how many you want, and so it is good to focus on categorical equivalences just because of that. But sometimes you can also build bridges um, connecting toposes which are not equivalent, but which, uh, uh, for instance, are related by a morphism, like an open morphism. Some, some morphisms which uh, allow you to transfer what you want to do. But in general, you see, um, one reason also of uh, restricting to um, uh, equivalence is, is the fact that the topos theory is actually very rich uh, in terms of the uh, two category theory of topos, in the sense that uh, you might start uh, when you do research with uh, some vague analogy, and then uh, you, uh, you might uh, think, okay, I can associate to this context a certain topos, and then to come to another context, another topos, and of course, at the beginning, these topos will uh, not be equivalent, uh, like, uh, unless you are extremely lucky. But uh, the theory of toposis allows you to perform many operations on toposis to make these toposis, to relate them and possibly to make them equivalent. 
You see, for instance, if you start from a topos, which is not Boolean, for instance, there is a procedure to make it Boolean, and so on. So th there are actually many, the, the theory of topos is very rich, so it allows you really to calculate on topos themselves. I have not explored this point in my talk, but it is important to be aware of that. So in some sense, uh, uh, my suggestion is, uh, if uh, the one has the feeling that two things might be related, the first thing to do is to try to define some toposes which capture some interesting features that you want to investigate, without caring immediately if they are equivalent or not. Then the theory of toposes, in some sense, will possibly guide you uh, on modifying your toposes or constructing new toposes out of the ones you have uh, already uh, obtained and uh, possibly get uh, an equivalence. Because you see, when you get an equivalence, then you can uh, transfer whatever kind of thing, and so you will be able to obtain a lot of connections that are not visible to the naked eye. Uh, tomorrow, the, the, the illustrations I will give will be uh, more convincing than uh, what I have uh, said today. Uh, but um, the, the point is that even very simple invariants can really give rise to uh, Huge surprises and um, and uh, different results. Another related comment. Yeah. Is this. So, so if you you speak of the equivalent uh, complexes, mm -hmm. but um, it seems that not much attention was given to the issue of whether of which equivalents you choose. In general, the world is just non trivial yeah. equivalences, or, or for instance, non trivial sum. Yes, now this is a very, very important uh, point that you make. In fact, uh, I have deliberately wanted not to uh, specify the equivalence because uh, it is quite interesting that you can compare <coughs> many things by completely ignoring the nature of the equivalence, uh, especially if you are interested in global properties, you see, properties of the world properties. Sometimes you, you see, for instance, the property of completeness of a logical theory, uh, you are interested in the world topos, and uh, so you don't care which equivalence you have. Of course, if you want to work with the objects inside the toposes, then of course, uh, I mean, you have to take a more local point of view, and of course, you will need to know the concrete description of the equivalence, or at least the action of the equivalence on the particular object under consideration. So it really depends, I mean, on, on what you want to do. But what I find uh, pretty striking is the fact that in uh, many situations, you don't even need them. Uh, the, 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 to have uh, an explicit description of the equivalence. What really matters is the fact that uh, the two things uh, satisfy the same universal property and so they are indistinguishable uh, from the point of view of the classification of that. So, I mean, the, I understand that you're a topos. I'm, I'm a, just an amateur, amateur, but the topos is very strong uh, framework, but uh, too abstract. If you apply to more something like uh, uh, structural linguistics or uh, other thing or area of something like uh, uh, physical theory like uh, holography or uh, CFT, ASD, uh, string theory, maybe more. But many have, uh, no, I mean, Topos theory has been applied uh, by many authors, including Ryan uh, of course, uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, nothing uh, with respect to uh, uh, what could come in the future. Because, I mean, uh, I agree with, uh, I tend to agree with, uh, with what I think when he said that, uh, I mean, the potential, the unifying potential of topos is very, very interesting. Uh, but this doesn't mean that people have uh, not uh, done a very, very good work in different directions. So, topos, uh, they have been applied in physics. Uh, even though, I mean, I wouldn't say with the spectacular applications, but I think one uh, basic uh, issue with uh, proposes is that uh, some, uh, some people from uh, the, the older generation have taken a point of view uh, that uh, separates uh, proposes with sites, which uh, separates uh, proposes with the, uh, from their presentations. And, um, and so this is the theory of elementary proposes, which are basically grotendic proposes without sites. And I think that this has been a dramatic mistake because uh, it has brought uh, topos theory uh, very far from the applications. I think what is very important to do is uh, to really keep on one end uh, the sides of the theories or uh, the other objects which are meant to represent the toposes, 
And on the other hand, the top office. It's very important to work at the two levels rather than just one. And I think that one reason for a lack of uh, very spectacular applications in the last years is, uh, one reason is this, is the fact that uh, uh, much of the work of category theories in uh, the last uh, years has been focused on uh, this more axiomatic approach uh, via elementary hypothesis, uh, which of course, I mean, was also valuable because they discovered some interesting theoretical results, but uh, which uh, was uh, not uh, really in the spirit of uh, applying the subject. So uh, I think uh, it's important uh, to work at the two different levels. Of course, it is hard then to work just at the one level. But uh, you see uh, these illustrations of the fact that uh, even a very simple invariant can manifest uh, itself in a completely different way in the context of different sizes. It uh, really shows that uh, there is a mathematical work continuity going on. And, uh, and uh, I think one should uh, profit from that, uh, uh, both conceptually, but uh, especially technically, because I really regard this as a, as a powerful machine. Uh, so it's not just a vague idea. It's something that is immediate for me. Yes, it's very important that you can compute. Uh, at the beginning of my talk, I hinted uh, at the, the fact that the purposes are really very complete in terms of structure. And this is very important for computations. Sometimes uh, things are difficult in mathematics because you are in a certain environment, you want to compute, and uh, you cannot compute because uh, otherwise, you will, I don't know, you might want to take uh, quotients by equivalence relations and uh, you realize that these do not exist. Or uh, you might want to consider functional spaces and again, <laughs> you will find that they do not exist. So in some sense, you are blocked in many situations and you don't even know where to go. Uh, in topos theory, this doesn't uh, happen because if you are inside the topos, whatever computation you want to do, you can do. And so technically, it makes a huge difference. Because then, you see, once you compute the level of topos, you can try to reformulate what it means in terms of the kernel of the site, uh, which generates the topos. Uh, and so, you see, you keep the, 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 the connection between the concrete level and the abstract one. Uh, but, uh, you see, you profit from the full computational power of topos. So, yes, uh, toposes are computational functions, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. More questions, but uh, it's, it's, it's good. Um, okay, thank thanks a lot. <laughs>